The New York Central were kings of the rails, generating as much flash as the most lavish Hollywood premiere. Discover why as we climb aboard the New York Central. In the early days of rail travel, there were no guarantees of success. Some railroads lived and died in obscurity, serving towns with names like Meridia, Clinchfield, and Amoskiag. But the New York Central was born to be a star. Formed in a merger of 10 fledgling railroad lines, it would grow to maturity in the shadow of the mightiest city in America, New York. The massive line eventually spanned half a continent, linking Boston, New York, Cleveland, and St. Louis. The Central's luxury trains became a playground for the rich, and the mighty railroad itself was the plaything of the obscenely rich. Business giants such as Cornelius Vanderbilt and bankers like Jay Gould would compete to possess the most famous railroad in the world. The New York Central's fame stretched beyond its trains. The railroad built a series of glittering stations with Grand Central Terminal in New York City as its crown jewel. But in the beginning, the railroad was merely a 17-mile solution to a small town problem. In 1826, the cities of Albany and Schenectady were linked by the Erie Canal. The 40-foot wide canal was an immediate economic success, setting off a trade boom in every city it touched. But there was a problem. The river route between these two cities was nearly 40 miles long. It was a very slow process getting between the two cities by canal boat, so that it was easier to go overland. Originally that was by stage line, and then this early railroad was built to form the connection between the two cities and provide a much faster service. Rail service on the Mohawk and Hudson began on August 9, 1831. Climbing the hills between Albany and Schenectady at nearly 15 miles per hour. The railroad was a huge success. Travel-hungry New Yorkers eagerly embraced the idea of travel by rails. The Mohawk and Hudson success sparked the construction of more railroads in the area and it all but shut down the five-year-old Erie Canal. By 1841, one could travel from Albany, New York to Buffalo entirely by rail, but not on one railroad. The 300-mile journey was haphazard at best and, at its worst, nearly impossible. The unlucky traveler had to buy seven tickets one for each of the railroads between the two cities. Each company also maintained its own timetable. This meant passengers often spent hours freezing in depots that were little more than shacks as they waited for the next train. And travelers couldn't check their bags through to their final destination. Each change of train increased the chance that luggage might be lost or stolen. It would be the same thing as trying to fly from New York to Albany, changing airports, changing planes, then flying from there to the next point, changing airports, changing planes. Uh, it was a disconnected trip at best. Uh, you had to uh, schlep your uh, baggage across from one railroad to the next. They didn't even necessarily change, uh, share the same terminals. Consolidation of the separate railroads was the answer. On April 12, 1852, representatives of the 10 railroads met at the state capitol to unite as the New York Central Railroad. The new line was unparalleled. It had more than 600 miles of tracks, 
making it the largest railroad in the United States. It was also worth nearly $23 million, a figure nearly half of the U.S. budget for that year. Its new president was Erastus Corning. Corning was a former mayor of Albany, state senator and United States congressman. He was also one of the richest men in America. Under Corning's leadership, the New York Central began to grow. His first act was to improve the young railroad's equipment, rails and bridges. One of the most spectacular improvements was the construction of the Niagara Gorge Suspension Bridge below Niagara Falls. The bridge was the genius of John A. Roebling, who later gained fame as the designer of the Brooklyn Bridge. The Niagara Bridge was a mammoth wonder of the age. It was a two-level suspension bridge, the likes of which New Yorkers had never seen before. When it finally opened on March 17, 1855, a crowd of curious onlookers watched to see if a locomotive and 22 freight cars could survive the spectacular trip. It was a success and marked the beginning of Corning's drive out of state. He built lines in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and even Canada, connecting them to the Central's existing track. But most importantly, Corning realized that the future of the Central ran through New York City. By 1860, the city was home to more than 1.1 million people, making it the largest city in America. New York City already had two homegrown railroads, the Hudson River Railroad and the New York and Harlem Railroad. Both were small-scale operations. The Hudson River Railroad was near bankruptcy. It ran nearly empty during the summer, gaining passengers only when the Hudson River froze solid. The New York and Harlem was a street railway that used horses to pull its cars until 1837. Both struggling railroads had recently been taken over by a 70-year-old steamboat man named Cornelius Vanderbilt. His was a true rags-to-riches story. As a very young man, he was born on Staten Island, and I think he was about 16 years old when he went into the boat business with a little boat that he ran across New York Harbor, and one boat led to another, and he pretty soon had a tremendous system of steamboats on the rivers and the waterways of the Northeast, and even had ocean-going ships as part of the Vanderbilt Empire. By 1853, Vanderbilt's worth exceeded $11 million and earned him the nickname Commodore. Vanderbilt was an unlikely railroad baron. His first experience aboard a train had ended in disaster. The one and only time that Commodore Vanderbilt actually uh, took a train ride, the train was involved in an accident. He said he would never ride another train as long as he lived. In 1857, he even told a friend, bring me a steamboat and I can do something, but I won't have anything to do with your damn railroads. But money was money. When Vanderbilt saw the opportunity to make some with those damn railroads, he took advantage of it. In 1867, Vanderbilt acquired the New York Central in one of the first hostile takeovers in history. He combined the railroad with his other holdings and formed the New York Central and Hudson River Railroad. The Commodore proved to be a brutally efficient owner. Railroads that opposed his New York Central were destroyed with a combination of political might and low fares. The press soon labeled him a robber baron. I don't like the word robber baron, it's so imprecise. Uh, I don't think he was a dishonest man. I think he was a capitalist of great strength. Uh, he sometimes took advantage of other capitalists and some of the Wall Street shenanigans of that period but I think the public got, uh, got good value for their money from the Vanderbilt companies. To further solidify his control over New York's rail system, Vanderbilt turned the company into a family-run business. One of his very first actions was to appoint his son, William K. Vanderbilt, to the board of directors. In 
Together, they began to leave their mark on the city's landscape. They constructed a fantastic new home for their railroad, Grand Central Depot. Opened in 1871, it was the first of three stations to be called Grand Central. Many New Yorkers criticized its location. On quiet, lonely 42nd Street, it was too far from downtown to ever be practical. But even so, no one could deny it was magnificent. Its interior was nearly an acre of glass. It was the largest and grandest building of its kind in all of North America at the time it was finished. Uh, and I think that was part of, of what Vanderbilt set out to do. He was making a statement by the grandeur of the terminal and I think people probably responded to it. Grand Central Depot was the number two tourist attraction in the United States, surpassed only by the United States Capitol. The Commodore enjoyed his success for only a few years. He died in 1877. He left his $100 million fortune to his son and two grandsons. His wife and eight daughters were given almost nothing. Cornelius Vanderbilt's passing ushered in a new age for the Central, with his son William in control. By 1882, the New York Central would reach out westward, reaching Chicago and St. Louis. That expansion sparked a bitter war with the Pennsylvania Railroad, a battle that would rage for nearly a hundred years. William Vanderbilt took control of the New York Central Railroad in 1877, after the death of his father. He immediately turned his attention to the west. Huddled against chilly Lake Michigan was Chicago. Thirty years before, it had been an obscure settlement, now it was one of the largest cities in America. Chicago was the center, the vital hub of rail traffic, moving products through a newly industrialized America. For the past 50 years, Chicago had been a major shipping port. By the 1870s, it had also become the railroad capital of the world. Midwestern railroad giants like the Chicago and Northwestern rub shoulders with growing southern lines like the Illinois Central Railroad. William Vanderbilt was determined that the New York Central would share in this shipping boom, and he was prepared to fight for it. The New York Central was called the water level route because it followed the Hudson River Valley north out of New York City, and then across New York State, the Hudson, the Mohawk Valley, and then the Great Lakes all the way to Chicago. So it really had no mountains to cross. Its rival was the Pennsylvania Railroad. Unlike the New York Central's water level route, the Pennsylvania had to cut its tracks through the rugged Allegheny Mountains. In its battle with terrain and the elements, the Pennsylvania left a trail of magnificent bridges and tunnels that still exist today. With these monuments to their will, the Pensy eventually conquered Pennsylvania and looked to the west towards expansion. Standing in its way was the New York Central. For the Pennsylvania, the Central was one more obstacle to be crossed or destroyed. It's hard ever to really think about the New York Central without thinking about the Pennsylvania Railroad at the same time. Uh, I think both railroads, in a way, define themselves in comparison to the other. The Bensey solution was brutally direct. It bought a railroad called the West Shore. It believed the line could be a competitor to the New York Central. The proposed route ran in the shadow of the Central's rails, up the Hudson and through Utica, New York. The trick back then was if you hated your competition, you built a little competing railroad next to it to try to siphon off the traffic. The West Shore was a tool the Pennsylvania used to try to get the New York Central. With its valuable Hudson River traffic threatened, the Central fought back with a similar strategy. The Vanderbilts, of course, got involved in the South Pennsylvania Railroad. 
which was a project to build across the southern part of uh, Pennsylvania in competition with the Pennsylvania Railroad. Vanderbilt's new railroad ran across Pensy's home territory, piercing the Appalachians with a series of nine tunnels, the largest of which was nearly 6,700 feet long, more than a mile. The South Pennsylvania Railroad was, uh, was very clearly Vanderbilt's uh, uh, tit for tat, his two can play this game sort of uh, response to the, uh, to the West Shore. A stalemate ensued. Neither side could claim victory and both railroads were going broke. J.P. Morgan, who was a prominent banker and money man at the time, recognized that this competition could do nothing but harm for all the railroads. And he took it to, uh, upon himself to see if he could end this wasteful competition. He invited the presidents of both railroads out on his private yacht, the Corsair, in New York Harbor, and kept them out there until they agreed to abandon this competition. In the interest of survival, both sides agreed to compromise. The Central bought the West Shore and used it as an alternate line. The South Pennsylvania was abandoned. It became a slowly crumbling monument to the most feverish rivalry in all of railroading. It would lay abandoned until the 1950s, when the tracks were replaced by the main route of the Pennsylvania Turnpike. With direct competition ended, the Central and the Pensy tried to win customers with speed. The Central Speed Demon was a locomotive on its Empire State Express train, which ran between New York City and Buffalo. The engine was the number 999, a rebuilt American-type locomotive that had been souped up for blinding speed. This locomotive had driving wheels that were 86 inches in diameter, 7 feet 2 inches. They were the largest driving wheels that had ever been put on a locomotive at that time. The engine reached a speed of 112 and a half miles per hour. It was amazing in many respects that they were able to operate that fast because it was a hand-fired locomotive. The firemen had to throw it in there by hand uh, as they bounced along at 112 miles an hour. The New York Central immediately polished up the locomotive and took it to the World's Columbian Exposition as an exhibit and uh, created a tremendous amount of uh, publicity for the railroad. This locomotive captured the public imagination. The U.S. government even issued a stamp in its honor. The 999 was a triumph for the New York Central, but another even faster train would follow on the heels of its success, and it became the most famous train in the world. In 1902, the New York Central upgraded its New York to Chicago run. The train was also given a new name, the 20th Century Limited. What made the 20th Century special was not what it did, but how it did it. It was not the first train to run from New York to Chicago. That honor fell to the Michigan Southern Connection, established in 1869. It was not even the first fast train the Central ran between the two cities. The Columbian Exposition Flyer had run the same route at high speeds in 1893. What set the 20th Century Limited apart from all the trains that would run before it and after it was the intangible style it brought to passenger travel. That style was the product of the New York Central and a new kind of railroader. George H. Daniels was the publicity manager for the New York Central, and he is the one who crafted the name 20th Century Limited. Daniels knew the importance of selling the hard way. He had been a patent medicine salesman. Not surprisingly, he was the first executive at the New York Central to understand that trains represented more than just transportation. Daniels knew that for the average customer, trains represented hope for a grand and luxurious future. His 20th Century Limited fit the bill. But much of the success of the train was tied to its name. I think uh, for many people, when they think of the New York Central, 
they think of the 20th Century Limited. To understand the name, of course, you have to cast back to the train's beginning, which was in 1902 when the 20th century was brand new, very exciting. It was a name that connoted all the modernity and speed and excitement that uh, the New York Central wanted us to associate with their new train. The name promised a bright and limitless future. The New York Central was ready to deliver on that promise. It did so with unsurpassed comfort and convenience. The Century was a rolling hotel, the likes of which the public had never seen. There was a valet on board, there was a stenographer on board, there were uh, radio, stock reports, newspapers on board, all in the era before um, modern conveniences. The traveler could also receive a straight razor shave at 80 miles per hour, coupled with some of the highest quality service ever available on the rails. The Century was the concord of its day, a place both to see and be seen. And there were plenty of celebrities eager to do both. The 20th Century Limited later became the shortcut from the Great White Way of Broadway to the silver screen of Hollywood. Ginger Rogers and Spencer Tracy were both frequent guests. The Century even became a star in its own right. In addition to headlining in a series of New York Central produced features, it would also have supporting roles in several Hollywood blockbusters, including North by Northwest. It also helped christen a new home, Grand Central Station. The old depot was swept away in 1900. Its replacement set new standards for size, efficiency, and most importantly, beauty. The construction of Grand Central Station marked the final emergence of 42nd Street, from sleepy outskirt to the glittering center of midtown Manhattan. Now, boarding the 20th century was as stylish an experience as riding it. But more importantly, there was the train speed. The century made the 960-mile trip between New York and Chicago in just under 20 hours. That meant the train traveled an astounding 80 miles an hour. This speed was reached through a combination of high-tech equipment, split-second scheduling, and innovative new technology. In addition to relying on superstar steam engines, the New York Central made it the job of every employee to make sure that the 20th Century Limited ran on time. Freight trains sat on sidings for hours just to ensure that the Century and the other members of the Great Steel Fleet arrived in Chicago by dinner time. The New York Central claimed that people could set their watches by the urgent whistle of the 20th century passing by. The 20th century's style, grace, and raw speed represented an irresistible challenge to the rival Pennsylvania Railroad. Within a year of the 20th century's launch, the Pennsylvania christened its own Ultra Deluxe Limited train. The Broadway Limited was the Pennsylvania Railroad's answer to the 20th century, and it was a very comparable train. The idea was uh, we can do just as good as the New York Central. Like the 20th century, the Broadway Limited was a masterpiece. And it's kind of interesting, as an aside, to recognize that when we hear the name Broadway Limited, immediately associate it with uh, New York's Great White Way, Times Square, sophistication. The Pensy didn't have that in mind at all when it named its train the Broadway Limited. What the Pensy had in mind was the broad, up to six-track right-of-way over which the train would fly between New York and Chicago. So the Broadway Limited really had nothing to do with the street Broadway, although I think that's uh, the connotation that it gained, and for most travelers, uh, that was the image that it called to mind. <laughs> 
The race of speed and style continued throughout the 1920s and early 30s. It reached its zenith in 1938. That year, the 20th century was remodeled by stage designer turned industrial designer, Henry Dreyfus. For most of their trip, the 20th Century Limited and the Broadway raced hundreds of miles apart. But that changed when they reached Chicago. Well, we, of course the race was on. And you would go just as, just as hard as you could go. If you were the fireman, you knew you had to be ready. So that engineer wasn't going to let them pass him. And they would pick up a little faster than we did. But we had the huge drivers. And once he got them running, there was no way they were going <laughs> to going to win because we would, we would leave uh, Englewood Station and we'd pass the drawbridge of South Chicago. We'd gone 85 miles an hour through the drawbridge. And we had him beat <laughs> every time. A journey on the new 20th Century Limited began on the most opulent stage yet, the new Grand Central Terminal. Completely rebuilt in 1913, the terminal was a mass of harmonious contradictions. Massive, yet intimate. Monumental, yet supremely functional. There are so many ways of talking about the greatness of Grand Central Station. After all, here is a 48-acre train yard in the heart of a city that has been inserted into the fabric of the city so skillfully that it's totally invisible. Another way of talking about the greatness of Grand Central Station, though, is the impact it has on each person who moves through it. All the people moving through that space really are moving almost in a dance pattern in harmony with each other. As passengers traveled down to the twin fan of tracks, they entered another world. They had this wonderful red carpet that they rolled out down the platform when it was time to uh, load the century and you would probably have seen any number of uh, celebrities boarding the train and photographers recording their departure. But the pop of flashbulbs as Hollywood mingled with Wall Street was just the beginning of a traveler's experience. Before the train even pulled away from the gate the luxury began with a round of cocktails in the observation car. This would be followed by a stylish dinner in the dining car. After dinner, the dining car went through a transformation. Concealed lights illuminated the car in a soft, rosy glow as music played from concealed speakers. The dining car became a club car known as Cafe Century. At the head of the train was the Century's mighty Hudson engine, streamlined to the point of being sculpture. It gave the train an elegant and modern look. The 20th Century Limited, uh, the first streamlined version of it, the Dreyfus design, was perhaps the most successful streamlined design ever developed for a steam locomotive. It was a steam locomotive, there was no question. They didn't try to hide it under a, a shroud and make it look like something else. It was a steam locomotive in, in all of its glory, but it also had this futuristic look with that great dome on the front end and the big headlight that stood out there. It seemed the magic of the century could go on forever. But the train's promise of a future filled with elegance was soon to be sidetracked with the coming of the Second World War. December 7, 1941 was planned as a day of triumph for the New York Central. Its latest streamliner, the Empire State Express, was being launched on that fateful day. Unaware of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the press gathered around the train's sleek nose. Eager ticket holders surged forward to board the gleaming new cars. The crowd didn't know it, but they were celebrating an ending, not a beginning. Soon the glamour and style of the New York Central was set aside as the country and the railroad marched off to war. World War II was, in fact, the best and the worst time for American railroads. Many of the railroads saw their highest levels of passenger ridership with all the troop movements, as well as their highest levels of freight revenue. 
It was also hard on the railroads in that the equipment, by being used and abused as it was, fell into disrepair and needed to be rehabbed as quickly as possible following the end of the war. Grand Central itself was strained to capacity. During the war years, uh, stations like uh, Grand Central were just typically wall-to-wall -wall people. Uh, lots of service people moving between one camp and another or on their way overseas. Families trying to travel. Uh, they were always with, with people day and night. When the war ended, celebrations gave way to new problems for the railroads. During the war, the railroads enjoyed traffic levels like they'd never seen in decades. And too many of them got the idea that this was something that was going to be permanent after the war. Uh, the New York Central came out of the war with the idea that they were going to maintain this traffic and made an enormous investment in hundreds of new passenger cars, new streamlined equipment for new streamliners. But the results were mixed. Passenger travel began to decline as veterans settled into suburbs and drove shining new cars on equally new freeways. One of the only success stories for the New York Central was the 1948 20th Century Limited. Clean, modern, and stylish, it picked up where the 1938 Century had left off. It rekindled the pre-war love affair between the 20th Century and its devoted public. Among its most loyal visitors was a man named Rogers E.M. Whitaker. Whitaker was one of the founding editors of the New Yorker magazine, uh, edited about a third of that magazine for 30 or 40 years, also covered nightclubs for the magazine for 40 years, and wrote a college football column for the magazine for 46 years. Whitaker also wrote about his lifelong passion for trains under the name E.M. Frimbo. Ernest Malcolm Frimbo was the world's greatest railroad buff. He traveled almost three million miles on trains all over the world, including every inch of train tracks in this country. Frimbo's stories were actually published off and on for about 45 years. Rogers Whitaker was every bit as eccentric as his fictional counterpart. Whitaker would actually take the great 20th Century Limited from New York to Albany, a ride of two and three quarters hours simply to get his hair cut. Two and a half hours meant that he had time for dinner in the diner and a shave and a haircut. He would get off in Albany at 8.30 in the evening. He would go over to the railroad YMCA. He would catch the 10 o'clock sleeper back to New York. Uh, it got in before five in the morning, but you could stay on board until seven. Then he would go have breakfast and be at his desk bright and early by 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. Whitaker's life was colorful and his stories legendary. In print today, they document a way of life in America that has all but been forgotten. These stories were first published when there were real passenger trains still running, uh, great trains like the 20th Century Limited. And they were trains that tried to make you feel that life was at its best when you were on board these trains. And his dismay came when train trips began to become threadbare and meager. Whitaker passed away in 1981. All told, he traveled an incredible 2,748,674.73 miles by train. None of these were more remarkable than the last 37. Roger's ashes were taken by his friends and family on a final trip via rail. At 10,000 feet, the Cumbris Pass is the highest point railroads reach on this continent. Whitaker's ashes were poured from the bridge and drifted down, mingling with the coal dust and smoke of the railroads he loved. Unfortunately for the post-war New York Central, the love of devoted travelers like E.M. Frimbo was not enough. The modern world was packed with new challenges. Highway construction was at a historic high and the allure of fast, cheap air travel was increasing. The last days of rail travel were in sight. But the New York Central wouldn't give up. <laughs> 
it set out to make one final play for passengers with some of the most innovative designs ever seen. To the casual observer, the 1950s were a golden age for the New York Central. The 20th Century Limited carried its glittering cargo from New York to Chicago. Pacemaker freight trains rocketed from Boston to St. Louis. And the corridors of Grand Central Terminal echoed with the voices of 200,000 travelers every day. But as time went on, cracks appeared in the Central's facade. Trains ran nearly empty. Rails and depots slowly collapsed due to age and neglect. By 1952, the Central was losing over $5 million a year. The economic downturn left the New York Central looking for a new kind of leadership. They found it in a controversial Texan named Robert Young. Robert R. Young was uh, sort of the maverick of the post-war uh, railroad era. He was first involved with the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. Got himself rather famous or infamous, however you want to look at it, by advertising that uh, a pig can travel across the country without changing cars, but you can't. Uh, and that was his way of promoting the idea of transcontinental passenger service. It was Young's monumental task to bring the New York Central back into the black at a time when U.S. railroads were losing over $670 million annually. His formula was simple. Combine style, raw speed, and a secret ingredient, Train X. Robert Young, even when he was with the Chesapeake in Ohio, got interested in the idea of very unconventional, lightweight passenger trains as a way of reviving the fortunes of the railroads in terms of uh, their ability to attract passenger traffic. So his research department on the CNO developed uh, the Train X concept. He quickly brought the concept to the Central. He named the train Explorer. It was new, it was fast, and it was impossible to miss. Young painted it bright yellow and launched it in 1956. The Explorer was an immediate and rousing failure. Its innovative design gave it a rough, uncomfortable ride and it broke down constantly. It quickly earned the nickname the Exploder and was pulled from mainline service. The train was the first in a series of tragic mistakes for the Central. The Aero Train followed. It was a joint project of General Motors and the railroads. The futuristic looking train featured a GM diesel engine and a shell made of modified bus bodies. Like Train X, it was bold, innovative, and uncomfortable. The interiors were plain and the bus frame suspension poorly suited to rough New York Central tracks. In desperation, the New York Central even tried to enter the jet age. Then the New York Central uh, took one of these diesel rail cars that they had, uh, rebuilt it with a very streamlined nose on the front of it, and put two J-57 jet aircraft engines on the roof and in one run got it up to 184 miles an hour. But in the end, the sound and fury of new passenger trains signified nothing for the Central. Revenues and ridership continued to drop. Staggered by mounting losses, the New York Central made a painful decision its beloved 20th Century Limited would make its last trip on December 3rd, 1967. I made the last run of the 20th Century Limited only because I had an agitated phone call from Frimbo the day before. It was a secret that the 20th Century Limited was coming to an end. The New York Central Railroad was so embarrassed that its most famous train, that the most famous train in the world was being withdrawn from service that they refused to announce it. But Frimbo had his ways and heard about it. So I rushed over to Grand Central Station and was able to get the last bedroom 
The dining car was open for business with the uh, fresh asparagus soup, prime ribs of beef, uh, baked Hubbard squash, and uh, fresh strawberries with whipped cream, complimentary champagne. It was an elegant affair. But the final voyage of the 20th century is remembered for more than its luxury. I managed to wake up at five minutes to four and find the conductor in the dining car going over his reports. And he said, yes, she's dying hard. There's an express train derailed up ahead of us. We're going to have to detour over some uh, N and W trackage. The train finally limped into Chicago nine hours late, which made it, in fact, six hours longer than the first run of the 20th century limited 60 years earlier. The end of the 20th century limited and all it represented was a loss from which the Central would never recover. It was a train that set out, uh, as its ambitious name implied, to sum up all the accomplishments and hopes and dreams of an entire century. It only lasted two thirds of that century. So for the next 30 years, people carried around those dreams in their pockets, hoping to find a place to put them again. For passengers and fans, the last run of the century was an end to style and luxury in train travel. For the employees of the New York Central, it was the end of an era. It was a sorrowful time uh, because we see something that we had, well, we had just come to think would never happen, that we would see the day when the 20th Century Limited didn't run because all our lives on the railroad, that had been the big thing on time. Less than a year later in 1968, the unimaginable happened. The New York Central merged with the Pennsylvania Railroad. The new line was called the Penn Central Transportation Company. For a generation raised on tales of the water level route, it was the ultimate betrayal. I think you could say it was unthinkable that these two arch rivals should actually join forces and create one railroad. Uh, what, what they ended up doing is simply putting together their weaknesses and making a new railroad with weaknesses that were even bigger than either of the two predecessors. In its second year of combined operation, the Penn Central Railroad lost $12 million. The Penn Central merger was kind of a unique merger because it was not a merger of two end-to-end -end railroads, but rather a merger of two parallel lines. They were duplicating a lot of the services to a lot of the same cities. It just was an ill-conceived merger from the start and was doomed to failure. Weakened by the flood of red ink, Penn Central ceased operation in 1970. Passenger routes went to Amtrak, and the New York Central's freight lines became a part of the consolidated rail lines known as Conrail. 20 years ago, the story of the New York Central would have ended with collapse. But today, the American public is rediscovering the cherished icons of the New York Central. Millions of Americans walk through a reborn Grand Central Terminal. The structure is once again the pulsing heart of America's greatest metropolis. I think around New York City, you, you feel that the New York Central is still here. The Grand Central Terminal is still there. It looks pretty much like it always did in the New York Central days. In fact, today it's getting a wonderful refurbishment to make it look as good as it's ever looked in its, its history. Uh, Commodore Vanderbilt is still there on 42nd Street, standing uh, at the south end of the terminal in his bronze statue, looking down on everything. So you kind of feel like it's, it's still there. And New York Central tracks are being readied for the run of a new high-speed wonder, the American Flyer, a proud descendant of the New York Central's 20th Century Limited. Frimbo today would be pacing the floor and counting the days until next year when Amtrak's new high-speed service from New York to Boston hits the rails. <laughs>
he would be on that first train and he would be on the second train and many of the trains that follow. And children gather in Elkhart, Indiana's National New York Central Railroad Museum to meet the men and women who built the Central. For a generation of children that were raised in the jet age, having a museum such as the National New York Central Railroad Museum will enable us to continue the legacy of the New York Central. We'll be able to expose these children to a way of travel that they unfortunately will never know. There may yet be a 21st Century Limited, reviving the power of the greatest name in all of railroad history. Until then, it exists only as a memory, a memory of opulence power and the mighty New York Central.